Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you here on this holiday season. Uh, this morning, I'm going to give a talk I've titled Resolve to Practice. So we're a few days after Christmas. We have New Year's coming up. I hope that whatever you've been doing this holiday season, whatever you normally do and whatever you're doing this year by choice or circumstance that you and your loved ones are safe and well. Uh, I know this can be a difficult time for people, even in the best of times, but I, I know it also can be a warm and festive time too. It's a time, an opportunity for us to be able to get together with friends and family who we might not see that often or maybe as often as we would like. And so uh, it can really be a, a joyous time. So I hope that this has been a, a nice season for you. And it's also a time when people make New Year's resolutions. And that's what I'm going to kind of focus the beginning of my talk on. You know, New Year's resolutions are those things you promise that you're going to be doing over the course of the year or that you're not going to be doing over the course of the year. And I used to take up New Year's resolutions. I think it's still something that people do. I had friends who swore by them, you know, they just said, well, I have to make New Year's resolutions or I never get things done. And I, I mine never seemed to take, I, I would give myself, maybe it was just too big of uh, tasks that I was giving myself. You know, I think mine are, were pretty common though. It'd be something like, I'm going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop eating so much cookies and candies. You know, I'm going to go on a diet this year. I'm going to do some kind of community work this year, you know, whatever it was. And I would, I would just tell myself I'd do these things and then they wouldn't happen. <laughs> or I would try and they didn't seem to really stick. And then I'd kind of feel lousy, you know, by the end of the year, I'd be ready for, okay, this year is done. I kind of screwed that up, but next year I'm going to make some new year's resolutions. And that seemed to be my cycle. So I'd make the new year's resolutions. So They'd try them out, they'd peter out, and then I'd just be waiting for the end of the year so I could make a whole new slew of New Year's resolutions and feel better about myself, and then do it all over again. So all I got to say about New Year's resolutions, if you make them, that's great. You know, if they work for you, that's fantastic. But if you do make them, wear them lightly. You know, don't grip onto them as tightly as I did anyhow. Don't identify with the resolutions. And so if you succeed with them, then you become the person you want to become. But if you think about New Year's resolutions, they're really just our usual way of doing things. And that's kind of what makes them such a challenge for us and why I think they can be disappointing and even depressing. Because New Year's resolutions work this way. They're sort of like, something isn't working. This isn't right. And I'm going to do something. And in doing that, it's going to correct the thing that isn't right. <clears throat> and they're often built, I shouldn't say built, they're often built into New Year's resolutions or ideas of things that you should or shouldn't do. I should do these things and X, you know, whatever result it is we want, or I shouldn't do these things. So you can start to see what it is about New Year's resolutions that can cause some problems. And that is it just adds something extra to our experience. Those shoulds or shouldn'ts. So here we have our life showing up and then we have a sense of what I should do or what I shouldn't do. And maybe from that sense of should or shouldn't, there arises a sense of the fact that just there's something going on right now that's bad and you need to get rid of it. And there's maybe something that's good and you need to get it. So this is our usual way of doing things. Things uh, right now aren't the way we want them to be. So we try to arrange circumstances such that they're gonna be the way we want them to be. This is a bad thing I have here. I wanna get rid of it. This is a good thing over there. I wanna pull it over to what, I, um, what I'm gonna do. And so once you've set that up, that things are bad, I should get rid of it. Something's good, I should get that. Now you've got to do something about it. And now you've got to take action on that. Either what you should do or what you shouldn't do. And if you think that 
shouldn'ting is easier than shooting. <laughs> and I'm guessing that you don't think that. All you got to think about is like how hard it is not to do something that you're telling yourself you're not going to do. Like, okay, I know there's a cookie jar in the kitchen, but when I walk through the kitchen, I am not going to eat a cookie. <laughs> you know? And so you're thinking about that cookie the whole time you're going through the kitchen and how you're not going to eat it. And if you're like me, then you don't just, that's just not as you walk through the kitchen. Then when you sit down or wherever you're going, you're still thinking about that cookie. <laughs> and maybe you have difficulties reading the article you're reading. And maybe you're reading the article because you should be reading the article because it's going to be good for you. <laughs> So it's kind of boring. And so you keep thinking about that cookie. And then at some point you finally go, well, it's just a stupid cookie. I'm going to go eat that cookie right now. And, and there you go. <laughs> so, so there's our shoulds and our shouldn'ts. Um, and like I said, then we try to do things about it and then we cause all kinds of problems for ourselves. And it may seem, we may look at um, the practice of uh, Buddhism and say, well, you know, there's practice like that in Buddhism as well. Perhaps you've come across teaching like the four aspects of the four practices of right effort. And those four practices are preventing unwholesome states that have yet to arise from arising, is letting go of unwholesome states that have already arisen. It's fostering wholesome states that have yet to arise and maintaining wholesome states that have arisen. Now, I put those in my own words, so those are kind of clumsy, but I was reading some uh, other versions of this, you know, it's a fairly common teaching and it really gets to be a mouthful sometimes, but that sounds like should and shouldn't unwholesome states shouldn't have those right we're preventing unwholesome states that have yet to arise from doing so we let go of unwholesome states that have already risen we're fostering wholesome states, it sounds like we shouldn't have unwholesome states and we should have wholesome states, but if you really look at at least the way I tried to word these things and the way they're generally worded, there isn't a should or shouldn't in there. It's not that you shouldn't have unwholesome states arising. They shouldn't be here. And that we should have wholesome states and they should stay here. There's none of that in the language of that teaching. And that's important because I do think when we take up these resolutions, there is a sense often of what we should or shouldn't be doing. And we have ideas about why that is. The other thing you'll see about those four aspects or practices of right effort is that they don't tell you what to do. I mean, what does it mean to prevent unwholesome states that have yet to arise from doing so or letting go of unwholesome states that have already arisen? Now, I know this is actually something that frustrates people about the teachings of the awake and it doesn't tell you what does it mean to prevent unwholesome states that have yet to, you know, what, what do we mean by that? And I'll touch on that, perhaps at least that frustration again later in my talk. But I at least want to point out to you that it's, it's important to note that it's not telling you to do some particular thing or not do some particular thing. And think again about how New Year's resolutions work. It's I'm going to do this thing or I'm not going to do this thing. I should do this thing. I shouldn't do this thing. And again, with the idea that there's going to be some result, it's usually going to be that my life is going to be better in some way. Or maybe we think we're going to, the world is going to be better because of what it is that we're resolving to do. But with the Buddhist practice of something like those four practices of right effort, there's nothing particular for you to do. And this reminds me of a story that I first encountered, I don't know, within the last like 10, 15 years. It's a story of William Penn and his sword. So that's William Penn, the Quaker, the famous Quaker, the guy that I used to think was on the Quaker oat box. <laughs> I always thought that was William Penn. It's not William Penn. I don't remember who it is anymore. But anyhow, that guy, the guy that you thought was on the Quaker oat box, that's the guy I'm talking about. And it's a story that first appeared in a biography of William Penn, The Life of William Penn, by Samuel M. Janney. There's a book that was released in, I think, the mid 19th century. And William Penn lived in the 17th century. Just kind of helping you to understand this because the story I'm about to share with you should be treated as a story. And my understanding is that its historical reality is probably non-existent because it first appeared in this 1850 biography about William Penn. 
And there's something you may not know about biographies. I didn't know this about biographies until I was reading how this probably was not a true story, that in the 19th century was actually not uncommon for a biographer to invent a scene that actually told some truth about the character that maybe it wasn't exactly true, but it told us some true thing about that person. If you're fans of the filmmaker Werner Herzog, the crazy German existential filmmaker, and he makes documentaries, he puts weird little scenes in his documentaries that are totally fabricated. There's a, a film that he made about cave paintings, you know, prehistoric cave paintings. And at the end of it, he starts talking about some albino alligator that got mutated by a nuclear reactor that's nearby and all that was made up. <laughs> but he was making all of it up to make a point. So that's what it seems like the story about William Penn is, a story that was told just to make a point. The reason that people believe that is because this story never appeared until this biography. So for about 200 years, nobody ever mentioned the story and suddenly it happened. And by the way, this is the biographer who wrote the story about George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, same biographer. So the guy's good, <laughs> he tells some good stories. So here's the story about William Penn. And to remind you again, we're talking about, um, talking about engaging in practice that doesn't have shoulds or shouldn'ts in it. And that really isn't about anything particular to do. So when William Penn was convinced of the principles of the Friends, that's the Quakers, and became a frequent attendant at their meetings, he did not immediately relinquish his gay apparel. It is even said that he wore a sword. So his gay apparel, he didn't give up his societal dress. So if you, again, if you look at Quakers or friends, they dress rather plainly. He, he dressed colorfully yet. It is even said that he wore a sword as was then customary among men of rank and fashion. Being one day in company with George Fox and George Fox was one of the, one of the uh, patriarchs of the Friends. Penn asked Fox his advice concerning the wearing of the sword, saying that he might perhaps appear singular among friends, but his sword had once been the means of saving his life without injuring his antagonist. And moreover, that Christ has said, he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So you see, Penn is coming up with some excuses now about why he's wearing that sword. He goes, well, you know, Okay, I know I'm, I'm dressing in my bright colors and I'm carrying my sword, but it helped me once, it helped me get out of a scrape and I didn't even hurt anybody. So it was okay. And, and Christ says, if you don't have a sword, sell your clothes and get a sword, right? And George Fox answers, he just says, I advise thee to wear it as long as thou canst. Not long after this, they met again when William had no sword. And George said to him, William, where is thy sword? Oh, said he, I have taken thy advice. I wore it as long as I could. And that story really just struck with me, that teaching of foxes. And so you have Penn and he's, he's struggling with this sword. He really is taken with the teachings of the friends, with their way, with their way of being, with their practice. I mean, the, the friends don't engage in idle philosophy. If you know anything about Quakerism, you know, they are engaged people, they engage in the world. And this was appealing to Penn. And yet he knew that not having that sword was a, they having this sword was a problem that he shouldn't have a sword if he was gonna be a friend, he understood that. And yet, well, here's some reasons why maybe one should have a sword. So he was making this argument and you don't see Fox say, yeah, you shouldn't wear a sword. He just says, wear it as long as you can. Wear it as long as you can. And that is a very interesting teacher because he's helping Penn to see that this isn't a question of should or shouldn't. This has to do with your own realization of what it is that's taking place. He's asking Penn to look to himself. And if you need to carry that sword, don't worry about making arguments about it. Carry the sword. When you come to realize that you don't need to carry the sword, then you won't carry it any longer. So he's not telling him to do anything in particular. He's not saying do this or do that. In response to Penn's struggle, 
he just says, in a way, he helps them to point out the struggle's not necessary. In a way, he's allowing Penn to struggle all he wants to with this question. And that's okay. It's okay to struggle with this question. At some point, you'll see in the struggle that you'll, you'll see what you need to see. I guess we'll put it that way. But you don't need to struggle. You don't need to ask these questions. You don't need somebody to tell you should or shouldn't you do that. But the struggle is okay. And I point this out because yesterday I was walking in one of my favorite local walks. It's a place called Wood Lake Nature Reserve, just a few blocks from my house. And they have cross country skiing there. And for some reason it hadn't dawned on me that there might be people skiing at Wood Lake. So I was just hiking around there. And a couple of times I got behind a family of skiers. So they were taking a child out who was learning how to ski, which I just think is so marvelous, you know? And, and the problem, kids have the same problem that I have, which is just staying up on skis. <laughs> Even on a completely flat level of ground, I still have a tendency to just tip over. I have no idea what just happened, but they're all losing my balance. And, and kids have that same problem for whatever reason. So I got behind this uh, mother and her daughter and the daughter was falling down repeatedly. She was just struggling with how to do it. I was there with her, you know, I was there with her pain and she was really not having a good time. <laughs> just put it that way. And uh, so I, I was standing behind them to give them room so that I wouldn't be walking right next to them, you know, giving them social distance. And so when the girl would fall down, I would just sort of pause. And I, I try not to put pressure on her so I would, enjoy the nature that was around me rather than just staring straight ahead. But I could hear the girl was getting very frustrated. And I thought, you know, falling is part of skiing. You know, so that that's no big deal. But to this girl, you shouldn't fall if you're skiing. So now we start to see again the usual way of doing things. When you're skiing, you shouldn't fall. I mean, that's the idea. So whenever she would fall, she'd get frustrated. And finally, this last time when I could actually walk around them because there were diverging paths. She was really not in a good place. <laughs> My heart, I just wanted to say falling is a part of skiing. I wanted to tell her this. But then I realized that her crying, her struggling with that, that's okay too. That's her skiing. That's her skiing right there. And I'll say that I, I much later in my walk, I was cutting across the path that people ski on. I was moving across the perpendicular. Yeah, perpendicular, you know, and uh, I saw the girl, and she saw me, and she'd see me behind her, and she had a big smile on her face, <laughs> and I don't think that that appreciation would even be there had she not maybe gone through that suffering. So sometimes that that struggle that we go through, you know, sometimes that can be helpful for us. It's not necessary though. You don't have to do it. You don't have to struggle. Carry the sword as long as you need to. You know, don't have to ask somebody, should you or shouldn't you? Keep falling as long as falling is what your skiing practice is like. And hey, if that frustrates you, that's understandable. It's no fun to fall. I thought it was worth noting that in what Penn was saying, that he was concerned about appearing singular. So I just want to read again what he was talking to Fox uh, about, at least according to Janny's story. He said, uh, uh, not what he said, but it's just what, what Janney recorded. He said that Penn was convinced of the principles of the Friends and frequently attended their meetings. Um, but then uh, he didn't relinquish his, his usual attire and, and included a sword. And um, he approached Fox saying he thought that he might appear singular among the Friends. And that seemed to be kind of an interesting thing because I think that this also drives our action sometimes. So in other words, he was afraid of um, what others thought about him. And we start thinking about our shoulds and our shoulds. And we think about why we might think that we should do something or shouldn't do something. Why shouldn't he wear a sword? Well, he had arguments about why he should wear one. And he certainly encountered among the teachings of the friends reasons why he shouldn't wear one. And he really admired the friends and he wanted to be a part of them. So now he was going to have to explain why, even though he understood their teaching, why he felt he needed to wear one. And it 
felt like it was going to make him stand out. He thought maybe they were going to think poorly of him, that he didn't have the same level of moral thinking or moral philosophy that they did. So he wanted to let them know, I no, 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 I've been thinking about this. I have ideas about wearing this sword. So he's concerned about what others think. He wants to be well thought of. He actually doesn't want to look like he's making mistakes or doesn't understand the teaching. And this reminds me again of a, a teaching that arose in our last practice period. Tom Bailey actually gave a talk last Wednesday on a number of talks from our last practice period here at Dharma Field. And practice period is just a, um, it's an opportunity for people to commit to a particular sitting schedule. And part of it is you go to some extra meetings before the big meetings on Sunday and students give talks there. And so we've been looking at Dogen's book, Shovel Genzo Zui Monkey, which are teachings that Dogen gave to monks where he was a head monk. And anyhow, Tom brought up a series of teachings that to me had spoken to me. And I was sort of happy. I knew I was going to bring this up in this talk today. And Tom didn't touch on this. So I was very sort of relieved about that. Um, but anyhow, it's, it's, it's what Dogen has to say about our practice and about being well thought of by others, because we know that this is important for us. Nobody likes to make a mistake. I mean, my, my mom was concerned about my development as a child physically, because I should have been walking at some point, and I wasn't walking. I was still crawling, or better yet, I kind of remember doing this. I found I could drag myself by my hands faster across the floor than crawling. <laughs> so I would do that rather than walk. And so, like I said, she was kind of concerned. And then she said, one day I just got up and I just walked all over the place. <laughs> and I, and I, I, I don't know if I'm making this up, but I think I had the thought in my head that falling down was bad. And so I wasn't going to fall down. So I wasn't going to walk until I knew that I could walk. I was going to drag myself across the floor <laughs> before I was going to fall down. So we know that we don't want to fall down in front of others. We don't want to look bad in front of others. That can be a driving um, motivation for us. And yet, then it causes us difficulties like Penn had, you know, because he was concerned what others thought. Because really, if you think about it, he really wasn't quite seeing things from the Quaker perspective yet. And he was kind of struggling with that. But Dogen tells us about our practice. He says, no desire to be well thought of by others arises, but only if you have truly left home and let your own body drop away. And I've slightly modified the translation I'm using. But again, he says, uh, no desire to be well thought of by others arises, but only if you have truly left home and let your body drop away. So really what he's saying by truly left home, let your body drop away, is he's saying you're not engaging in the usual ways that we have of seeing the world and doing things in the world, that's leaving home. And that you've let go of that sense of self, you know, let go of that body that we hang on to. However, Dogen continues, if you think, let others think what they may, and you act unwholesomely, indulging in this or that, you'll go against the way of the awakened. Simply do what is wholesome without expectation of reward or fame, be truly gainless and work for the sake of benefiting others. So what he's telling us is, you know, there's no desire to be well thought of by others in this practice, but that doesn't mean that you can go ahead and indulge in unwholesome activity. And that might, seem like, well, yeah, I wouldn't think that. But if you're thinking what he's saying is this practice isn't to be well thought of as well thought of by others, you might think, well, then it doesn't matter what I do, especially if you understand that you are Buddha. This is a teaching that you'll hear at Dharma Field, but you're already awake, you're already enlightenment. So anything that you do in a manner of speaking really is an expression of Totality is expression of wholeness. So if you want to eat that extra cookie, I mean, it's just totality expressing itself as wanting to eat that extra cookie, right? But Dogen's saying, no, that's not right either. 
So it's not to be thought well of by others, but it's not about indulging in unwholesome activity either. So you don't go, that's just me. I just like to eat extra cookies. Well, that's not the practice either. So just remind you of the teaching from the Dhammapada, verse 183. Do what is wholesome, avoid what is unwholesome, purify your mind. This is the way of the awakened. So this is the way of the awakened, to do what is wholesome, to avoid what is unwholesome. And in doing that, purifying the mind. Now, this is the stuff that I know drives people crazy. Do what is wholesome. You probably hear that all the time. Do what is wholesome. What does that mean? How do you do what is wholesome? How do you avoid what is unwholesome? What does any of that stuff mean? We might be able to understand avoid what is unwholesome. We might, if we think that unwholesome is something that's bad. And we, we think that we know how to, to avoid bad things. But that's not what it's saying. You know, It's saying avoid what is unwholesome. And that even has you know, that's not even quite getting at what it is that we do. But do what is wholesome. How do you do that? And I think that's a maddening thing. And when people hear act out of the whole, well, what does that mean? Well, again, know that you are always doing it. You're always, whatever you're doing is a manifestation of the whole. Now realize it. Now see that that's what's showing up. When you actually see what's taking place, when you see what is actually now, then you can begin to see what is unwholesome. What is unwholesome? Well, you can feel it when you feel that this isn't enough, right? When there's something else to get, when there's something that you can do to bring something else about. Now you can see that unwholesomeness is arising. You can't really do that until you are attentive to what's showing up right now. And again, we don't normally do that. We normally just kind of blunder our way through because we make assumptions lightning fast. They're not, we don't sit and just make assumptions at every moment. We just, we move through our lives making assumptions. But the fo to follow the way of the awakened, the Buddhist way is to realize, to be what is. It's to see what is now. It's to see that what is now, or simply now, that now is you. That thing that we usually call me or you. Right? We think of that as somehow separate from all of this. And so that's when we start getting into this, well, I could be better, right? And that's again, New Year's resolutions. I, I could be a little bit better this year than I was last year. And you start, to separate the world. There's something over there I need to get. There's something here that I have that I can put off to the side. And just in the way that we think about those things, you can hear separation. There's this thing that I have that I can get rid of. Not seeing that whatever that thing is really is just part of the totality of what's showing up right now. And we might hear a teaching like this and go, oh, I get it. I'm the tree. <laughs> Maybe you'd say that. I don't know if you'd say that or not. But there's a teaching by Tozan. He says in the uh, um, mirror, of, the jewel mirror of awareness, I, I can't get that all jumbled up right now, but in, in his great poem, he's one of the founding teachers of Soto Zen. You, uh, it's not that you are here to say, it is you. It's to realize that what you are taking for you, for me, is really just this experience, its totality. And then we put a label on it and we flip everything inside out. In fact, usually we don't even think about it. <laughs> We've just done that. We've just already assumed that I'm there. And there's a world out there. And then we have feelings about it. And we think we don't like what is showing up right now. And so we reject it or we try to change it. You know, and it comes from the sense that this isn't what it should be. You know, what it should be should be this other way. It's this way right now, but it should be this other way. So with Penn, that wearing a sword isn't what it should be. It's not what a friend should do. So it's not what I should do. Or perhaps if you've been taking up this practice for a while, if, you know, again, we have the sense things aren't the way they should be. I mean, I felt that way a lot when I was a kid. I was trying to remember this teaching when uh, at Tom's talk on Wednesday, because I, I wanted to share it. I still can't remember, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't remember this, but I can tell you the feeling I had. 
as a little boy, and I was little, I was probably like three years old, four years old, that life was unfair. <laughs> life was really unfair. I cried a lot when I was a boy. If I felt like a little raindrop on me, I'd start crying. I had known I needed to go inside. I wasn't supposed to rain. Perfect days didn't rain, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I remember thinking that life was unfair. It shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be this way. And I'd get really frustrated because I couldn't make it the way it should be. And the thing that I'm forgetting is what my grandparents told me. That made me even angrier, <laughs> which was something along the lines, but it was much gentler and it was a better teaching. But it was just like, oh, shut up and take it. <laughs> it was something like that. And, you know, our parents probably had something like, uh, you know, um, they would, you know, make up some place like, well, you got it a lot worse in India or something like that. You know, they'd say something like, appreciate what you have. And that would be so frustrating to me as a child. But maybe as we take up this practice, we start to go, okay. I realize that this is the way things are, but I, but you get this idea about what a Buddhist does, what a Buddhist should or shouldn't do. Buddhists do this, they don't do this, right? You hear the precepts, follower of the way does not kill. So if you just stepped on that ant, <laughs> I don't know, you go, okay, I just killed something, but a follower of the way does not kill, so oh no, no, I'm not being a good Buddhist. You know, so we might have these ideas like Penn had about being a friend, a friend doesn't wear a sword. A Buddhist wouldn't do this. A Buddhist shouldn't do this. So maybe you have that idea in your mind as well. You know, again, linking this back to our practice. Or, you know, I, I'll hear people say this sometimes, like, well, I know I'm not supposed to do this as a Buddhist. I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyhow. <laughs> you know, because it's like having that extra cookie. It really doesn't matter that much. I, I know I shouldn't have that cookie, but come on, it's just a cookie. It's not really going to and maybe that's tied into your sense of self-identity. Maybe you do that because you're naughty. You're a naughty person. You've always been a naughty person. So you're going to go ahead and break that rule. I know Buddhists not supposed to do that, but I do that. Or, or maybe you're a rebel. Uh, I told the story several times about a young woman that uh, I met at college. I mean, I didn't really meet her. This was my only encounter with her. But she was an undergraduate. I was a teacher at uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. and Doors, the elevator opened, the elevator was pretty full. She was the last person in the elevator. She was wearing like a Batman t-shirt before Batman uh, became the thing. He was still a thing, but he wasn't the thing he is now. So she was wearing a Batman t-shirt. She had a lunchbox, one of those metal lunchboxes, might've been like a Scooby-Doo lunchbox in her hand. She had blue hair and she was wearing like her belt was a seatbelt buckle. <laughs> and I remember she, she came in and everybody was doing, you doing elevators. They're all facing the elevator doors and they're all quiet. And I just went, she's going to make a comment about that. She's going to tell us how we're zombies doing this. And sure enough, within 10 seconds, she, oh, you people, you should enjoy life or something like that, you know, as if, you know, we weren't doing, you know, following conventions exactly what she was doing, which is following. So maybe you think that you're the rebel. And so the Buddhist rules, well, I know I shouldn't do that, but I'm naughty or I'm a rebel or maybe even you get a, a kind of subtle and you go, uh, you know, let others think what they may. I'm just being myself. This is just the expression of totality, the way that I'm showing up right now. So that's following the way. But as Dogen pointed out to us, that is not following the way. That is confusion. That is having some idea. That's creating a new way <laughs> that might be your way might be the Steve Matushek way of doing things and then following that instead. So that's your own path. Buddhism, the way of the awakened is just to be fully aware of what is, to be awake. To be awake to what is right now, fully awake. So it's not to, to push off the stuff we don't like or we're embarrassed about. It's one of the things that Tom had talked about in his talk. Is how Dogen was admonishing people. Just you know, watch that. Do you want to hide your what you think of as your mistakes? You want to hide your bad behavior, and you want to look good. That's not what this practice is. This practice is to wholly be what it is that's showing up. It isn't about right or wrong. It isn't about should or shouldn't. 
it sounds like it sometimes. You look at this, you know, this thing about, about encouraging wholesome states to arise. It sounds like it should. Letting go of unwholesome, that sounds like it shouldn't, letting go of those unwholesome states. But again, what is it that you're being asked to do? See what it is that's showing up. Be fully the totality that is showing up. Be that. But again, we usually have those evaluative terms that we throw in there about right or wrong, about should or shouldn't. Not even realizing that we're evaluating the situation. It just comes up often automatically. We just have a quick response to it. It's about this is right or this is wrong, this is good or this is bad. And you know what, sometimes that can be helpful. So I don't even wanna say that. Again, I don't wanna give you the impression that it's wrong for that immediate thing to call into your, you know, to, to pop into your mind. You wanna be aware. You wanna see what it is that's showing up so that you can step out of the way you know, if something, you don't, you just don't have to evaluate it. You know, if a, a truck is barreling at you, in one hand, that's a bad thing, <laughs> you know, but you don't have to go, this is a bad thing and then evaluate it. What should I do to undo this bad thing? You know, just be aware and do what needs to take place. That other stuff is just, as I said, it's extra. It's adding something. And yet that's not even actually true either. Because that little extra we're adding, that's still the experience of totality as it's showing up to evaluate. But again, we have to see we're doing that. Usually it just shows up. We just go, okay, this is a bad situation and we respond to it. And we're not fully present. We're acting instead out of ways of understanding, of evaluating the world that we have. So again, we don't see that we're doing that. We think, well, there's something here that needs to be straightened out, something that's not right that needs to be straightened out. Perhaps like me at those New Year's resolutions. I'm just not, I got to change something about me. There's a new me coming up in 2021, and it's going to be a bolder, brighter, funner, funner. I don't think that's a word. I don't know. More fun <laughs> version of Steve Matushak. That's my New Year's resolution. But that's not you know, again, that's just business as usual to do that, to see that we're doing that. So again, this isn't saying don't make New Year's resolutions. You got to wear the sword, wear the sword, but see what it is that you're doing. See what is the impetus for making the resolution and acting on it. You're not, you know, I might joke, I'm going to be a better and bolder me, but the only me you have is where you are right now. It reminds me of a teaching of Karen Mason Miller's from her book, Cold, Hand Wash Cold, Hand Wash Cold. And she says, I don't practice meditation because I'm someone better. And I would even say she could have just as well put, I don't practice meditation to be someone better. I practice because I'll never be anyone else. This is it right here. This is what you have. So are you going to be awake to what it is that is this or are you not that's really the question you know there's no you know there's nobody else there there's just this and when we talk about this this we talk about this me i guess i say you're not going to be anyone else i'll never be anyone else well okay you know that you can hear in there that people might think well I, uh, I know Buddhism. Buddhism teaches you there is no I. <laughs> but if you really look at what she's talking about, she's talking about what I was talking about before. It is you. you know, it's this, this that she's talking about. It'll never be anyone else. This is what you have right here. So when you say, I'll be a new me, and you hear the teaching, but you'll never be anyone else. What is that anyone else? Who are you? That's what this practice invites you to look at to ask about who are you or what are you? It gets back to my last talk where I was talking about that question mark. So you'll never be anyone else, but just what is that? What is it that Karen Mason Miller is pointing to when she says that? To see that I think requires a different kind of resolution, a different kind of resolve. And it's a resolve to wake up to what is here 
what is now. You know, it's not to argue with it. It's not to come up with all these reasons why you're doing things the way you're doing them. Okay, I know it's that there's this this thing, you know, whatever it is. I know there's a Buddhist teaching that says this, or I know that my life is like this and I'm supposed to be what it is, but being what it is really sucks. And so I want to be, you know, I know that that's easy to do that, to kind of get into that. Really struggle with that. It's easy to do. And like I said, struggling may be part of the practice. That might be your practice at this moment is to struggle. But if our resolution is just to wake up to what is here, what is now, that's okay. That struggle, that just that's what's showing up. And we have to be there with it. We can't circumvent it. We can't short circuit it. Wisdom is not something where you can um, peek at the answer. You know, you can't just sort of like look at an answer book and go, okay, that's, there's the wisdom right there. Now, wisdom is the whole, it's the struggle you're going through right now. That's a release from that struggle. And it's the constant coming and going. Wisdom is life. It is this journey of life. But again, getting back to Karen Mason Miller's teaching. She says, I don't practice to be better. I don't practice to become better. I practice because I'll never be anyone else. So again, what does that mean? And what does it mean then for you in each moment? If you don't resolve to wake up to what is here, what is not. The resolution to practice now is, if not now, when? If not you, who else? That's a different kind of resolution, I think, than our usual New Year resolution about the particular thing we're gonna do to bring about the particular result that may make us feel better or may not. But we can wake up to what we're doing when we do that. We can see what we're doing when we're taking up our New Year's resolutions. Again, even if you take them up, Take them lightly, take them up lightly. Don't identify with them. Don't expect things from them. See when you're doing that, just see when you're doing that. And when you're seeing that you're doing that, it becomes easier just to let that go, to give up those expectations. So the resolve to practice is to be the resolve to get to the heart of what I think a lot of New Year's resolutions are. Okay, well, as usual, uh, this is a very different talk from the one I intended to give. (laughs) I even started out with a completely different quote that was sort of the inspiration for today's today's talk that didn't end up in today's talk. And I also was watching Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which is on Netflix right now, the film version of the the, um, August Wilson play. And I heard something in there and I went, oh, I got to talk about this in my talk, but I don't want my talk to be two hours long. <laughs> so, so I do recommend the movie. Uh, I think it's uh, really worth seeing. But, um, anyhow, that's, I just got off track here, but that's my talk. If people have questions or comments, I welcome them. Hello, my name is Bruce, and uh, <clears throat> I want to say thank you, Stephen. That was a great talk, and I think to the point, really. W- at one point, you were talking about the totality, and uh, you mentioned the tree. Well, am I the tree? And I, I used to think, for example, well, I'm going to go for a walk in nature, <laughs> which now I kind of think is kind of uh, silly in a lot of ways because I was seeing myself as separate from nature, that somehow the human being is that thing that is different from nature itself. And then I realized some time later on that 
No, just as a butterfly or a river, a tree, um, I am or we are uh, another expression of that. And um, it just uh, made a lot more sense to me to see that as everything is really just another expression of nature. And there's not really that separation that we feel all the time. It doesn't necessarily go away, that sense of feeling separate. It's constantly arising, it seems to be. But it doesn't have um, the, uh, the holding quality, <laughs> you know, as it used to have, you could say, in a sense. But um, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments, Bruce. Yeah, nature is uh, it's one of those those things, isn't it? It's just a, such a sticky term. <laughs> um, and yeah, then we start dividing what's natural from what's not natural. You know, and you can speak in those terms. I know um, I've heard some teachings here at Dharma Field where we talk about acting, you know, naturally or, or not naturally. And there we're talking about out of the whole and not out of the whole. And you can just see how nature works. You know, I was describing to somebody, um, one of our Sangha members here lives in England. And so she was experiencing a super lockdown because the coronavirus has mutated. I'm hoping I'm not freaking people out right now. It's just something that viruses do. So in the course of their life, they mutate and they usually mutate. And again, I don't mean to freak people out, but they usually mutate in such a way that they're more contagious, um, but they're usually less deadly. I mean, that's usually the way they go. You know, my understanding from, um, from Abby was that it's, it's uh, that that wasn't exactly the case, or at least it didn't seem to be the case. But, but regardless, then I was trying to describe it to somebody and the best way, and I uh, was just to think of it as like a, like a, rather than having um, a will. So you talk about the, the virus, for example, um, when it's really deadly, what happens is it kills all of its hosts. So if it doesn't change, <clears throat> it's going to die out with all the hosts that it's killing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it mutates and then it can, you know, spread out to more and more population and not necessarily kill that population. And it almost sounds then like the virus has a will, like it's gone. Well, I don't want to kill any more people because we need new homes, but it's more like thinking of like a trickle of water that had an impediment in its way. And it just sort of worked its way around the water. You know, that's sort of natural reaction. That's what the virus is doing. And so Bruce, just along the lines again of what you're talking about, is usually when we think of nature, <clears throat> uh, there's just this, um, this way we have of thinking of a, a world that, I don't know, it's a sticky term. I don't wanna get too much in there, but I know what you're talking about. We're, we're separate from nature. And I think that this has caused uh, the environmental problems that we see in this world. That we see ourselves as separate from nature, that nature has its own rules that are separate from humanity's rules when humankind is actually very much and we could see a, a very powerful factor in this reality. So, so thanks for sharing, Bruce. Any other questions or comments? Great, I wanna thank you all for sharing this morning with me and, uh, and the Sangha and we'll see you next year. <laughs>